Then we, we start again. A couple of people still try to clone their business cards for the raffle. Um, but it's about time. So next talk um, is about Isinga Web, how to write modules. And Eric, Isinga Web Lead, um, tells you more about it. Hi, everybody. Um, I changed my topic for the talk last evening. So um, I guess you will, I hope you will like it. Um, I will show you in the next 45 minutes the first steps on how to write your own Isinga Web 2 module. Who of you is already using Isinga Web 2? Okay, plenty of people. Who has never seen Isinga Web 2? One, two. Okay, I have one screenshot for you. Great. <laughs> um, our last version is um, 2.4.1. It was released in January. And with version 2.4, um, we introduced a couple of new features. Um, we finally implemented an API command transport, so it's now possible if you have Isinga 2 and the API up and running to send commands um, in Isinga Web 2 over the Isinga 2 API before we only had the remote command file or external command pipe. Um, in our configuration forms for MySQL resources, we added SSL support, so if you choose um, to use SSL, then you will get plenty of configuration options to enable it. It's now possible to export our detailed views to JSON and CSV. Um, we only had this for our list views before, and now um, you have the chance to um, export detailed views of a couple hosts or services to JSON and CSV as well. And um, for users which are authenticated over database, they are now allowed to change their password. Before an administrator had to change it, um, yeah, I think it's pretty cool. Um, we introduced some small UI. Um, features, we have a monitoring action bar for quick actions like check now, schedule downtime, acknowledge problem, whatever. In detail views, um, we now have an action bar where you can quick access this. Um, we have announce banners, so if you have special events running in your company like um, outages, for example, or um, introducing new versions, planning rollouts, um, administrators, administrators are allowed to um, create announce banners and every user will see a message um, in the top of Isinga Web 2. We have a package for or a Selenux policy. The package is called Isinga Web 2 minus Selenux. And we um, forked Zen Framework 1 because we like forking, obviously. Um, now, the reason was um, Zen Framework 1 is EOL, but we think it's a pretty cool framework. And so we forked it and um, yeah, continue using it in Nicinga Web 1. Um, this is the screenshot, I promised. Um, it shows all yeah, features we introduced. We have the announce banner um, in the top. We have um, the monitoring action bar and detail views right here. Um, we moved our status information, the counters, to the bottom. Um, and reduced the header size. Yeah, so you have more space for your um, actual information. Okay, that's about it for um, the last version, and now we dig into how to write modules in Isinga Web 2. Has anybody of you ever tried or wrote a module for Isinga Web 2? One, two, three, four, five, okay, great. Um, you were successful? <laughs> All of them, okay, good. <laughs> Um, yeah, you may ask, um, why should I write a module? Um, we think that I think Web2 is the ideal basis for starting your own project because, um, yeah, it's open source. We share a great community, of course. Um, we think that it's pretty straightforward to do it. Um, we, we try to keep it, to keep it stable. Um, if we introduce new features, then old features and old API calls will still work. Um, we designed it to be future-proof and hopefully easy to understand. So um, actually, there's no deep knowledge of PHP, HTML, CSS, and JS, whatever required. So if you're not a PHP hacker, then don't worry. You may still do it. So why not? We have some, some lessons learned from Isinga Web 1, because um, with Isinga Web 1, we tried to enable people to write their own modules. Um, but we had a pretty complex framework in there. Um, it was Agave. And um, with Agave, we had um, this 
cool XML configuration, which, which was pretty, pretty complicated. So um, yeah, nobody wrote a module, um, except we. So yeah, we should keep it simple and don't use XML. Because we found out that um, the best tool for processing XML is already installed in every system, and it's been a RAM. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, thanks. So the three major points um, when developing a single web tool was keep it simple. That means um, as few as dependencies as possible. We should understand our code so that everybody else should understand our code. We try to keep it rea rea reliable, so um, when introducing new calls, keep um, compatibility ready. And I think Web2 is very performant, so we have a very small footprint, and page loading is very, very fast. Um, we focus on convention over configuration. That means um, if you put things in the right place, you don't have to configure it. We um, choose or always choose reasonable defaults for configuration values. And um, we're not using XML, but the any configuration format for our configuration, because it's very easy to read and write. Um, the libraries shipped with iSingleWeb Web 2 are Send Framework 1, um, or our fork of it. Um, for the JavaScript part, we have jQuery version 1 and 2, because iSingleWeb Web 2 um, supports Internet Explorer starting from version 8, and jQuery 2 is not compatible with that, so um, we ship for i.e. jQuery version 1, and for all the other hipster browsers, we um, yeah, use jQuery version 2. And then we have um, small other libraries, um, for example, parsing Markdown to um, HTML, having DOM PDF for rendering PDF, and we have less PHP for um, translating less to CSS. So where should you start when writing your own module? You need, of course, have to have to install a single web too, and best practice is to use packages. Um, of course, you can also download a source tarball and start from there. That's no problem. But with the package, you have all set up um, config directories, users, um, the Apache configuration or Nginx configuration, for example. And the next um, point is to extend the module path. Yeah, I think web two ships with some um, core modules like the monitoring or translation or documentation. Um, and if you're about to write your own modules, you should create a separate module path to put your stuff in there. And um, the configuration is done in uh, any file. And we put for this presentation, we use user share I single web two minus modules. Um, but this configuration can also be done in the front end, so you don't have to hack any, any file, but can also use the front end to extend your module path. So the next thing is give the module a name. You should keep it simple, because you have to use the module name in PHP namespaces, in the file system, and URLs, of course. Um, maybe it should reflect what it does. Um, starting with the company, day, company name may be a good idea, but Overall, keep it simple. And then you only create the module um, beneath your module path, which is um, the module path from the example beforehand. And then we have um, the iSinger CLI um, with two commands here. Um, the first one is list all installed modules, and the second one is um, enable all modules. So now we have an empty module directory and already enabled it. Um, yeah, that's about it um, for creating a new module. And of course, you can do that in the web interface as well. You go to overview modules, get your modules. We're using Showcase and can enable or disable the module right here. Um, we have a file in the base directory of the module called module.info. This is where meta information of the module is kept. For example, the name and the short description. And this information will be shown in the web and in the CLI as well if you list uh, infos about the module. So we start our showcase module with uh, some CLI commands. The iSinger CLI 
um, is designed to offer all application logic um, of Web2 and all its modules to use it also in the CLI environment. A good example here is um, the monitoring module. You can list status information in the web, but you can also list the status information in the CLI too. Um, the Isinga CLI helps you to provide cron jobs, plugins, and even small services. Um, for example, we have the business process module where we have a check plugin written in the Isinga CLI. When you create a business process, you can check it with the Isinga CLI. And we have bash auto-completion already configured if you use packages. Um, so you can tap through your Isinga CLI and get the right action if you have no idea uh, what actions are available. So now let's start with creating our first CLI command. And we just have to create a file beneath um, application CLI commands in our showcase module directory. And we are starting with a say command. And this is a pretty good example of convention over configuration. Um, in our code, does this work? Great, we have showcase, this is our module name. We have a command, which is say. And we have our action, which is called something. So. Um, this gives us the scheme of how a Isinga CLI command is built. And it's just Isinga CLI module command action. In our case, it's Isinga CLI showcase say something. Um, we saw a namespace beforehand. This helps us to encapsulate our code and also modules. Um, every module is separated in its own namespace and built from its name. That's why we should keep it simple. And um, the namespace for CLI commands is CLI commands. Pretty straightforward. So let's start doing something. Um, this command just echoes something on STD out, right? Um, and if we call it, I think a CLI showcase says something, it says something. Woohoo! <laughs> okay. Um, this is two minutes of action, and you already have your first CLI command up and running. The next thing is, you should document your code. Not um, only for yourself or your other developers around, but the help for CLI commands is generated from inline documentation. And you get help with um, the known minus minus help um, option, which is everywhere used. So we um, add some PHP documentation to our say command. Um, yeah. And we can print this information with Isinga CLI showcase minus minus help, and everything we put into our PHP documentation is printed to STD out. Successful actions in the CLI always return exit code zero, and um, if there's an error in your application, you have an exception, then um, all exceptions are called in CLI and are printed in a readable message on, on STD um, out. And um, in this case, the error case is always one. So if you check the return code of your plugin, um, in case it's successful, it returns zero, and in case it errors, it returns one. Um, and if an exception happens, um, and you don't put the minus minus trace option um, with the command, you only get a single line error message, but with minus minus trace, you get the full print um, to the stack trace. Um, and we create a small example here. We have a fail action, which just throws an exception. And if we call this action without the minus minus trace, we just get a simple error message with this will not work. And if we put minus minus trace here, we get the full trace why or from where this um, error message comes from. So the minus minus trace option right here shows the full stack trace. So when developing a CLI command, it's always a good choice to use the minus minus trace thing because if an exception happens you will you will get where it comes from so now a cli command is nothing without good parameter handling and we have standalone and named parameters in uh, the cli which um, and in our code if um, an option is not given we can have default values and the instance or the parameter objects for handling parameters is always um, this, which is the reference to the CLI command we're in, and the parents object is um, the class or object where we access our parameters we, um, given, we have given on the command line. 
So we start with extending our documentation. We now say, okay, we have I think I see CLI say something what? And we use the params object and shift the parameter because it's a standalone parameter, it's had, it has no name. And if we want to say something nice, we print something nice as we just say something. So let's try this out. Um, we say something nice, and hey, what a great audience we have today. So uh, the next example would be um, to have name parameters and um, default values for name parameters. We have, um, um, again, we extend our documentation because it's always cool um, to document what we have. We have the minus minus shout um, option and a default value of false. So if I don't put this shout parameter on the command line, it evaluates to false. So we don't shout by default, but if we want to shout, yeah, we shout. So what a great audience we have today. So I think a web, of course, has, has its power in the web, has its strength in the web. So we bring our module to the web. Um, we have, with the Send Framework 1, we have the MVC paradigm. We have actions and controllers, few scripts for representation and styling, and we have models. But um, in our case, we only have library code. We don't call it model because, yeah, adding another layer of complexity would make it too hard. So we just have library code, controllers, and few scripts. And we will focus on controllers and few scripts, no library code this time to make it easy. Again, convention over configuration. Every action in a controller is automatically a route in Web2. So when you create a controller and an action, you don't have to configure this action is this URL. You just put a file um, in a configured place, and then it evaluates to I think a Web2. This is host, I think a Web2, module name, controller name, and action name. That easy. So let's create a controller. And yeah, since we all like Gin, we need a Gin controller. This is what it looks like. And again, I highlighted the module name, controller name, and action name. So we have our doop, module, our controller, and our action. So this is about it to have your own route in Isinga Web 2. It's um, Isinga Web 2 show showcase Gin flavors. Now, when we browse to this URL, we get this. The application tells us, OK, there's a few script missing, because we remember we need a few script for um, showing the data and having a presentation. And it already tells us um, where we need few scripts. So we have application controllers for our controllers, and we have application few scripts for all our few scripts. Um, and in this directory, there should be, or there must be, a directory for every controller. So we have a gin directory here, and we have one few script per action, and that is the flavors um, PHTML. PHTML because we mix PHP and HTA, mix PHP and HTML in this file, so it's not HTML and not PHP, it's PHTML. Um, this is what a few script looks like, um, and we have two. Um, classes here, um, which you should always use in your few scripts. We have um, controls, where we put a header, for example, and we have our content, where we yeah display some gin flavors. And that brings us um, three things. We have automatic borders with um, controls and content. We have scrollable content and fixed controls. That means when our content grows bigger, then um, users are allowed to only scroll the content, but um, the things you put in controls are sticky. And yeah, that's what it, what it looks like. We have our, our heading we displayed, and we have some gin flavors here. And if um, we add more and more gin flavors, um, the gin guide headline would stay sticky, and we would only scroll over the flavors. So what's missing here, if you know Web2, is that we don't have um, a nice tab here for navigation. So let's add tab navigation to our um, action. Again, we have our 
Gin Controller class with our flavors action. And to add a tub, we just um, get the tubs object here, add um, the this is just a key, you could call it whatever, but um, it's always good to name it um, what it does. So we have a flavors tab, it's active. We have a label here and prints, make it translatable. And um, the URL is just the URL um, you have from module controller action, so nothing special here. And wait a moment. In our view script, we have to add these tabs um, to our controls. So tabs, of course, are always sticky too. And without that tabs object here, and these are just PHP short text for echoing, um, we print out the tabs. And when we now navigate to our action again or refresh our action, we have a flavors tab and a refresh button automatically added. Now, what's missing? We have uh, tab navigation. We, all, we um, also want to have menu entries. So let's add a menu entry to our great uh, flavor action. Um, users may always add their own menu entries because that's just URLs. So users are allowed to browse um, and use the URL they see and add their own menu entries. But modules may also provide menu entries, and that is done in the configuration PHP um, in the base directory of a module. So again, we have a single file where we put, um, where we extend our, our menu entries. And the configuration PHP in our case looks like this. We create a menu section, we call it gin, and of course the icon um, is thumbs up. And we add, um, we have a section gin, and we add um, a second level menu entry which is called flavors, and we point the flavors to um, showcase API flavors, which is the URL. You don't have to put um, your base URL in here because um, I think Web2 knows your base URL, so you, won't ha you don't have to put HTTP host slash I think Web2 slash showcase, whatever. You just put the relative URL part um, of your module controller action right here. Um, and the next time our menu is reloaded, which happens automatically every 30 sec seconds, we have um, our gin menu entry with the flavors action, and that's automatically highlighted. You see that it's, that it's white and the um, label is petrol, because I think a web 2 matches the URL against the URLs you've configured in menu entries, and um, it then decides which menu entries um, I think web 2 has to activate. So now, if flavors change, we also want to know that and see all flavors in a dashboard. Um, so next to our service problems, we want to have a list um, of all gin flavors we know. So we will create our new dashboard for that. We can also extend existing ones. And that's also done in the configuration PHP um, of the module. So again, our configuration PHP. Um, just a comment from our previous section here is the menu entry, and we add a dashboard. In this case, it's a new one, and we add our gin flavors um, dashboard right beneath and point it to the URL we already know from the menu entry. If you choose current problems here, for example, and the monitoring module is enabled, then I think a Web2 will extend the current problems dashboard because um, the monitoring module already created it. So you, you don't decide whether to create a new dashboard or not. You just give it a name, and if it already has been created, um, your further dashboards will be added beneath. And we have one thing to do. Um, remember that we added controls to our view script, which were tabs and our headline, but we don't want to show tabs and the headline in our dashboard. So we just add a simple PHP. When we are not compact, then please print controls, and we are not compact when we are not in the dashboard. So this just excludes the controls when the view or the controller is rendered from a dashboard. 
And now, after we've saved our configuration PHP and navigate to our dashboard, you see that we've added a new dashboard showcase. With our um, gin flavors right here, we gave it a title, and then it renders just a few scripts. And you see there are no tabs and no headlines here because we excluded it. So now we want to auto refresh this page. And enabling auto refresh is pretty simple in Async Web 2 because you only have to call one function. And from the monitoring module, we already build a very stable auto refresh um, functionality. Because we want that you put Async Web 2 on a dashboard, for example, and it could run there for ages, not running out of memory or stop working. Um, so that's um, a point for reliability. Um, auto refresh just works with this call in your controller. We just enable it with setting an auto refresh interval, um, and this is the number of um, seconds um, in which interval it should auto refresh. So um, when you have it in a dashboard and you don't touch it, then it will refresh every 10 seconds. So when new flavors are added, um, then you will see it. Now, yeah. Um, the layout of our few script was pretty basic, and now we want to add some CSS to style our module. And CSS, or less in our case, less extend CSS with some dynamic functions, um, well, yeah, dynamic paradigms like functions, we have variables, um, we have mixins, we, we are allowed to extend other classes, so less is, a, is better than CSS because, um, yeah, we write less um, CSS and produce, um, yeah, with less effort, um, good CSS. Um, but you can also use just CSS if, is CSS if you want. So if you did not write less before or anything else, then just use CSS. And um, one point to note is that module styles are isolated. So every rule you put in the module S file is only valid for your module. So if you write something crazy there, you can't break any other style of a single web two or modules because you are only allowed to manipulate the styles of your module. Um, the file is public CSS module.less. And yeah, we just do some, some basic styling of um, headline one and headline two as example for isolated menu styles, uh, isolated CSS. And we add a class list stripe where every odd child of the list will have a gray background. So um, these styles um, are effective already because um, we have no CSS class but styled um, HTML elements. And for the list stripe thing, we have to extend our view script and um, put the list striped class um, in our list element we've added before. And that's what, it, that what it, that's what it looks like. We have um, a red headline and a yellow headline here, and we didn't change any other thing um, than our uh, module view presentation. And the list striped here applies to our flavors list. Now, we feed our view with data, because controllers collect data and put it into the view for presentation. We had a few script where we put all our fr flavors in the few script, but maybe the flavors come from a database or they are scraped from anywhere. So we will um, use the, our controller to collect the data, give it to the few script, and then in the few script we will render the data instead of putting it um, into HTML ourselves. How do we do that? In our controllers, we have, um, again, an instance of this, which is just a reference to the controller. And then we have a view property on the controller, which represents our view. And then we just um, tell the view, hey, you have a key and a value. And this key and value um, we use in our view script with um, this key or just key. So in few scripts, you're allowed to omit the, um, this reference and just use key. To make um, this a bit more clear, we um, 
put our flavors we had in the HTML, we now get them, um, we now write them in our controller. So our view now knows flavors with the flavors we had before. And in our view script, we just use this flavors, loop over them, and escape it, because if a flavor has any special character, then your HTML should not break. And if you already has a function for this, so we escape it and echo it. And instead of having um, your data in the view script now, you have the data in the controller. The controller passes the data to your view script, and in your view script, you now use um, these data to display it. You saw many translation things. We have this translate um, in controllers, views everywhere. That means that when you call this translate, translate me in PHP, you make this string translatable. Um, it's not translated yet, of course, because you have to do it. But with the Isinga um, CLI module translation, which we have to enable beforehand, um, you can refresh your catalog. Um, in our example, we use um, the local EDE. And then it grabs all calls to translate and offers um, these strings for you for translation. And um, we choose or we use um, the tool PureEdit because it's everywhere available for translating um, uh, your strings to your locale. And then you, you use um, Isinga CLI translation compile the EDE. And um, if you have the German locale, for example, used in Isinga web, then um, it will automatically translate your string to German instead of um, displaying it in English, um, what you have written in your code. Let's go to configuration. And I will show you how easy it is to use our any configuration. Um, for example, OK. Um, configuration for modules is put in um, ITC Isinga Web 2 modules module. Um, this is the default path, which comes from a package installation. But in um, web servers and in CLI, you can override this directory to set it to your own, to your own location. Um, but if you um, have Isinga Web 2 installed from package, that's the path where module configuration goes. In CLI and controllers, we have the function config with an uppercase C, which loads config from a file. And our default file is always config any. So if you don't put a parameter in this function call, then it will just try to read the file config any. And of course, you can just put more um, any files in your module directory. And with this config um, file name, you will load the um, file you specified. Um, that's pretty basic. Um, any configuration format, um, any configuration has a section. And then beneath the section, you have key value pairs. And the config class offers um, the function call get, for example. We can just get the key. In our case, we would um, get value because we specified the key in our config file. And if we would access a non-existent key or a key which has not been configured yet, uh, we can give it a default value. So in our code, if we now access the um, no key, we will get the default value. <coughs> um, if you write your own module, you may have additional CSS and JavaScript file. For example, if you want to use Bootstrap for your module or type ahead or whatever, um, you can tell um, that your module provides these additional files. Remember that we have um, predefined names and paths for our default files, which were the um, module less for CSS and a JavaScript file where a JavaScript file would be located for a module in module.js. But you can also provide vendor code. Um, for example, I choose type ahead. And we put the type ahead CSS beneath CSS window in our module directory, and the JavaScript type ahead JS beneath JS window. And again, we have the file configuration PHP, where we put all additional menu 
configura uh, module configuration in. Um, there goes menu entries, dashboards, and also our additional files. And to provide these files, we added, we just um, tell I think Web2 that, do you see it? Bloop. Um, we provide a CSS file, which is located in vendor type ahead CSS, and we provide a JS file, which is located in type ahead, a vendor type ahead JS. And I think Web2 automatically um, recognizes that um, you have new files in there, and it will compile um, or add all files you add um, to its main JavaScript and CSS files. So I think Web2 does not ship um, these files directly. It just collects all CSS and JS, JS files um, I think Web2 has itself um, of all modules and of all additional files um, you specify. And then it um, concats them to just one CSS and one JS file. So when you browse to a single web 2, you don't get like 100 requests for every CSS or JS file it loads. You just get two, and you just get it when it has been changed. So the first time you exercise single web 2, you will get um, a CSS and a JS file. And all calls or all browsing you do afterwards, you won't get the CSS and the JS file again. So that saves, um, yeah, saves much network overhead if you would load it for every time again. Okay, do you have questions so far? Nobody. Good. Ah, okay, you. Sorry. Um, I think Web2 has, um, sorry? Oh, sorry, yeah. Um, uh, the question was how to fetch host and service data in your own module. Um, I think Web2 provides libraries for accessing um, databases, and um, the monitoring module uses um, the um, IDO um, for um, accessing the data. And the monitoring module provides classes to, to fetch the data. So you don't have to write your own stuff. You can just use um, what the monitoring module provides. Of course, you have to enable the monitoring module, but then use this code um, in your own module. I don't have an example right now. I can show you afterwards. But yeah, that's about it. It's pretty easy. Um, we have, um, I don't have a slide for this, but we have um, theming in Isinga Web 2. Um, with modules, you can only, with module um, CSS or less, you can only override the styles and presentation for your module. But maybe you want to add your own company logo um, when, you, when it comes to your login page or want to change the colors of critical or whatever. Then we have theming. And um, with um, these, you can override the whole Isinga Web 2 styling. And we um, have predefined variables which come from our um, less stuff we use. We can just override it, right? Um, one color code, for example, to um, change the critical color from red to black, for example. Okay. So, if there are no more questions, or maybe yes. Five minutes, right? Yeah. Uh, is there a documentation for all these functions, abstract classes? Okay. Yeah. Um, the question was is there documentation? Um, for all functions and classes we use. Apart from this presentation, no. <laughs> okay, we have, we document our code. So you could um, create an API documentation from PHP Talk um, with tools like PHP Documenter. Um, we plan to have an own CLI command for that to just generate it, but we don't have it yet. So, um, yeah, you would have to either ask in our forums or wait for documentation we bring up. Yeah, so that's a point um, I didn't mention, obviously. Um, um, we have no great documentation yet um, about what you can use and how you use it, but I think um, we'll do that um, having some guides on how to access monitoring data, having some guides on how to providing menu entries, dashboards, whatever. So, um, yeah, we will at some point provide documentation on how to use stuff from our framework, but um, we don't have it in a big complexity yet. Ah, yeah, right. We have a German, it's not English, but we have a German version on GitHub. It's called Isinga Web 2 minus module minus training. 
Um, it's a pretty long markdown file, um, which targets a couple of things I presented here. Um, maybe that's a good starting point, but it's not in English. And it's outdated. <laughs> <laughs> but since I think Web2 is pretty stable, you could use most of the parts, I think. Hopefully. Yeah. <laughs> yes, please. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. The question was, um, since I think Singer 2 will become a new data model, will I think Web 2 have uh, a new module for accessing this data too? Yes. <laughs> Finally, a good answer. Okay. <laughs> okay. Good. If you have any questions, come to me. Write us a mail, whatever. We help you. Thanks. Thank you, Eric. <laughs>